welcome to another session um, with Alexei Novakov talking about Scala type classes. Okay, hi everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, yeah, you probably might be a bit sleepy after the lunch, so it's a usual time where people will fall in a bit asleep. So I'll try to entertain you within this 45 minutes. Um, I'm not sure, maybe Scala is like not really popular, uh, mainly uh, um, main Haskell based uh, conference. But anyway, so it's um, the functional approach in Scala is really kind of getting popular and rising. So I assume if you um, look at Scala from a Haskell perspective, from other functional programming language, it might be interesting also to know um, what, what is Scala. And uh, also would like to know how many of you are working with Scala you know, daily or Okay, some people here, that's good. So if you're already in the industry doing Scala, that topic might be familiar to you, so you might just maybe find some um, new things. Somebody who didn't really work with Scala, that I think that would be interesting. So the talk is about uh, type classes, basically how they are encoded in Scala and how they are encoded right now and how they will be encoded in a new version of Scala. And um, yeah, a bit of comparison with Haskell and maybe in other languages we have time. So just a couple of words about this. I probably, yeah, I usually do uh, talk standing, but yeah, I'm missing my um, clicker. But anyways, we'll try to do like this. So a few words about me. Um, I'm Alexei, I'm working in the company Ultra Tendency. We do big data projects. And they're actually, I mainly was working with Java and like the last four years more. Uh, switch to Scala as an uh, entire AFP concept, which, which I like and uh, it's a bit of fun of. Um, so, type classes. Um, what the problem basically they try to solve, um, like in any language, and primarily that started from Haskell, then it, so the talk is about um, Scala, so we'll go through Prism of Scala. So the, the main problems uh, when we use um, subtyping instead of uh, type classes, for example, in Scala, so that's, that's quite possible. So it also has a uh, paradigm in Scala. So you have a coupling once you use the uh, polymorphism, which is a necessary, th necessary thing. Um, also, um, if, if you want to add some functionality to already existing inheritance chain, so there might be a, a problem you may break something, or you really don't want to add some additional functionality with using subtyping. And also at least a bit of uh, weak type safety by this, and I mean, um, where at some point you would need to maybe to do explicit conversion or implicitly it's already done in subtyping uh, um, paradigm or with all people programming languages. So there was a couple of problems here, but not all of them, right? So on this simple uh, example with the hierarchy of animals where you may have a subtype so of like a pets and wild, and wild animals. So at once upon a time you define this structure and later you might need to add new members so you don't really want to extend from wild animals here or some entity or some, some kind of animal. Um, so some of these problems, um, basically type classes are supposed to be solved, basically they solve it. And how they solve this problem basically by introducing so called ad hoc polymorphism. Um, so, type classes in Scala are not first class type uh, citizens, they are basically programming e idiom. Um, and they are heavily based on the uh, special construct called implicit, which, which is a keyword as well, so, and, and the notion of the implicit search. So we will see how this how this is working for uh, this kind of prefix of the polymorphism for ad hoc for um, most of non-native English speakers. So you might ask, what does it mean ad hoc? So in short, this means you define something on purpose when you need. So when you need, you add that uh, type class instance. When we later see that, so you don't envision in advance your uh, um, type of class hierarchy or type hierarchy. So you. Uh, have a way to expand it later. Um, the origins is, uh, you might probably know, it's coming from Haskell, or from Haskell. It, everything started with this white paper by Philip Waller and something like that. And this paper is basically describing uh, um, the difference between ad hoc polymorphism and parametric polymorphism, much more things around. Um, so Polymorphic polymorphism, if we describe in a couple of words, uh, so that means 
we have a generic function which defined for uh, different types that it uh, works in the same way, way for any type. So no matter which, which exact type this will be. For example, the lens function or size on, on a collection, right? So it doesn't matter which type or by the day this collection will have in or float. On the other, the lens will uh, care on how many number of elements. And another um, polymorphism, which is which produced by the paper, ad hoc polymorphism acts um, kind of an orthogonal way or opposite way. So it, it's a function defined for, for many types, but it acts different for, for each type. And for example, multiplication of uh, certain types. So here, if we, if we look at examples of tokens, so you might need to implement the multiplication of how mathematically we implement multiplication for ints and uh, for doubles, so you, you, might, you will have a result as a double if you multiply two doubles or two floats. And another example could be multiplication of vector and matrix, and so you might expect some, some pretty fine result from a mathematical perspective. So it, it depends which type we put, so that's how the implementation will be. So if we also look at subtyping and then an ad hoc polymorphism, so with subtyping, what I was, uh, I used that a lot. Uh, I was always finding myself in something situation like this. So if I have uh, traits or interfaces, like Java, for example, interfaces in and Scala, there are traits which, uh, like uh, like a type class, basically we'll see they are used there or to encode type classes. I have different traits, surroundable equality, hashable, printable. So in order to implement all of them with uh, subtyping, so we have this unnecessary rela relation, and we need to explicitly define in the class declaration that we extend or implement the specific uh, subtype. With the type classes, it feels like it's more linearly, so it doesn't really have this so many uh, extension or uh, hierarchy or inheritance. So it's something like you have a serializable uh, type class or trait in, in Scala terms, and then you implement it for specific types on the side. So it, it doesn't really uh, bring that uh, instances implementation in the same uh, class. For example, this could be some type A or B. If you don't really extend that from serializable, you, you implement type instance on the side. But that's the beauty, as for me, the, of uh, type classes itself. They basically decouple you from uh, implementation and original design of the type or of your type systems. So how do we implement type classes in, in Scala? How does it look like? So as I mentioned, um, this is an idiom in Scala and before we go to Scala an example, let's just briefly look how a uh, typical Haskell type class will look like. So one of the standard or simple approach would be a number which has uh, three functions, uh, additional application gates so with the same type A. And we have a couple of instances for that, for this type class. One is for info, one for float. So by eventually it's delegated, the implementation is delegated into some standard functions like add int, mal int, and add float, mal float. So it's kind of uh, neat and concise here. Whenever you need to add one more instance, you define one more instance here, and and basically that's it. So it's quite quite short. Unfortunately, in Scala it's not like that. Um, it uh, requires quite a lot of typing, and as I mentioned before, it relies on this idea of implicit. And so shortly, what, what's on, on the slide? Uh, I tried to map the the uh, snippets of the code that you saw on the previous slide. Basically, we have a a type class which is encoded as a trait so with the two functions multiplication and addition, uh, which is called num. And it has two parameters of the same type, and then inside of uh, object instances, so in Scala we kind of really put in a file to uh, the instances we need to wrap in some module. The unit of module in, in Scala is this object keyword, basically like a single form in Java, and we defined two instances, so we we implement with a new operator kind of doing subtyping here, but it's, but it's not. So we define here two values with implicit keyword here, and these values become like an object uh, eventually. So they will be used by later polymorphic functions, which inside the object num, which is um, expecting that there are somewhere instances of those 
uh, the particular types for A here uh, below that will know how to mod modify, for example, ins or floats. Uh, basically, depends on A, which will be passed to to this definition of the function. Um, here, you also can see this implicitly. Uh, it's it's a method. It's something like a lookup from the context, which uh, tries to find that implicit object to to uh, which will be used. So basically, this function, like plus and multiplication, delegates the uh, logic of this particular operation, like multiplication or addition, to the type plus instance. Uh, so here we just use, in type plus instances, we use standard uh, approach how to uh, multiplicate or add two numbers. Again, we delegate it to standard operators, plus and, and, and multiply star. So we will go into details, but the main difference is uh, that in Haskell, you have a new type classes instances. So there is a global namespace. There is so-called uh, definition coherence, and there is obviously language support for that, for the type classes, because that was originating, originating language for type classes. So we have a class word and instance keywords. And in Scala, we have, we can do multiple instances for the same type. So the multiple instances can coexist, but one can be used at a time. So this could be a, an advantage and disadvantage. So we'll speak a bit about this a bit later. But there is no like a special support, that is why you, you, you've seen that, it's like a bit of boilerplate with encoding the type classes on the previous slide that we used traits and implicits, and then we used objects and add some promotion functions and, and much more. So we'll see how it's how it looks like later. Yeah, as for the coherence, uh, again, for not English uh, speakers like, like me, I always like checking uh, the, uh, the originating word, what does it mean behind the scene, right? So it's like, uh, the context of, of type class is basically coherence means that there should be only, only be one instance of a type class for any given type. And that's uh, by definition in Haskell, but in, but in Scala it's, it's not like that. So you can have multiple and different parts of your Scala program instances for the same type, but it's only important that once it's going to be call side, there's only one instance is available that compile can pick. Otherwise, it will be ambiguous error and type that error will compile time error. So we'll look at this also later. Yeah, that's just a summary of what I just said. So multiple instances can coexist. So this could be a flexibility and advantages, uh, advantage of Scala. From another district, uh, side, this could be an error prone. When you accidentally imported some instances for the same type, um, you don't really know where it comes, where these instances are coming from. So you basically end up in time debugging your program to understand how to import or disambiguate your program to select particular those instances. And that may require uh, additional boilerplate or disambiguate uh, some technique to, to do that. So um, in coding, we just saw this briefly, but the ingredients of this encoding basically the, uh, the common way I would say to, to do it through traits with generic parameters. The second one is implicit instances with concrete type and some third ingredient which I call something like user API but basically it's like a set of functions or more functions which are using implicit parameters and they allow you to, to use this function in a way for, for different types as long as those uh, Type plus instances around, otherwise this won't, won't compile at call side. Um, so trade was generated per, per parameters. Or, um, so there is a one parameter here. The example uh, here is something like a, a two string in Java maybe, or uh, I believe um, in Haskell it's called something like a show um, type class or so. So I just set to name it in my way, like a formatter of a hands which has uh, Method FMT, which takes any type and to return the string. So just one parameter uh, for this type class, and then how do we define an instances? So we put them somewhere into the module, and we define the formatting for float boolean and more generic formatter basically for a collection. Um, yeah, so for a collection, what we do, so you may ask you, should I implement the instances for all possible uh, types of, of the collection itself? So here we, use, we define for a list. So list itself is a highway abstract, right? So it, it takes another type for, for the elements. 
So we don't want to uh, have a situation where we define instances for all uh, possible types of delays. We have a support for that here, again, with the uh, with the implicit that we are saying here, literally in this construct and in the third instance for delays, that we will um, we have we define this instance as long as the, there is a parameter around for this a. So we, we see it as a parameter here, implicit ev, which stands short for um, evidence that this a uh, should have also a parameter. And then we will use it basically. You see an a dot map. So we map all the every element of the collection and we delegate the formatting to this EV to format every individual element. And then we basically compose the whole collection to a string with the MK string uh, method. Yeah, as I mentioned before, the implicit here is like a backbone of whole um, of the later resolution of the implicits and the search for a particular instance. So we, we use this keyword here. Um, and finally, third ingredient is something like a uh, user API where we put uh, those polymorphic functions which are based on the uh, type class. They take this as an implicit parameter, and by the end of the day, it's just a simple delegation to that implicit parameter. So, yeah, so we use this AV polymit formatter FMT and, and give it this A of a type A. Um, so, and then how to use it uh, from the user perspective. You import explicitly the instances of uh, type class that we define in that uh, object instances with the keyboard keyword. And then we uh, define some, some collections or some values. So here are just a three list. And then we, we say, okay, we want to format it with, uh, with the formatter that we already have from instances. Uh, we, as you remember, we have one for float, for booleans, for list. So Two first list will, will compile, let's say this thing that will compile, but third one will, will not because we didn't defy, uh, define the uh, instance of formatted for the int. And that's Scala's compiler says that it couldn't find a implicit value for a parameter. So it doesn't really say I, I couldn't find a, a type of instance because there's like a not first uh, class citizen in Scala itself. So it says in a, in a, uh, in a terminology that Scala is, is based on. Um, a little bit on the second ingredient, implicit instance with concrete type. Uh, there is um, some some practice around how, how people encode that. Basically, they, they, we place them either in companion object, which is something like um, object of a specific class, which holds the static content of your class. So if we compare that with, with Java, for example. Uh, or we place them in any other object or trace. So as long as we will be later be able to import these instances. Uh, in search, um, that's the most complicated area. Scala compiler has the, the rules how to search uh, implicit instances. And there are some like a order of these rules. So there's not a full list, but basically in, in the apps like a local inherited definitions using imports or companion objects of uh, type class or parameter type. And then providers is something like the instances or the keyboards we use, whether we define with a val or def to get this type class object. Yeah, this is a quite quite complex thing, so um, you might need to take this into account if you once you design um, type class instances or use them. So well, how the search is working in Scala compiled when. It might be handy to know when you end up in a situation where your program doesn't compile because of this issue where multiple type instances for the same type are available on some whole side, and then you may need to understand where to look at. So this could be a bit uh, weird. And this user API again, we export it in single tone object, or as extension methods, this is something like a syntactic sugar, which we will look uh, in a second. Um, yeah, in the form of polymorphic functions which take these implicit uh, instances. Um, again, the uh, user API or like these functions uh, uh, and user function that we will use later uh, polymorphically, um, we may, we can define it in such way that okay, we have this implicit parameter, but there's like two more, um, or basically one more way to to use syntactic sugar instead of this implicit EV, you can also use, you can text bounds 
and place this colon after the type in the, in the square brackets before it's saying that, okay, for this A, I need a formatting to work to basically to be compiled. That means that the uh, compiler will, will look for instances of a type class that, that will be needed to, to, to resolve what you call call site when it's, when it's using this FMT function. And there's a trick basically how um, you can also enable this formatter a.fmt using uh, embedded apply function, which can be called without the name. So it's, uh, you can omit this apply name and just call it formatter dot. Um, yeah, one more thing is function met methods. You can also do like an postfix uh, way to call the same function, but without this formatter type class name dot. You can um, do something like implicit class to enable extensions, extension methods, and how it looks like eventually below, we have a list uh, of floats boolean, so we can call the same idea, or the same formatter within postfix phrase of dot fmt, then the result will be like here in the, in the commands. So just a bit neat way, but it also uh, requires you to, to do this um, additional code to enable this. Um, as, you, as we mentioned, the type classes can be defined inductively, so with example for a list uh, as long as it will work, as long as the, there is around an evidence for, for the uh, element of, of, the, of the collection of the list. And as we, we say, the, our requirement is we need a formatter for A and then we are fine. So we define the um, type of instance for a list we're saying that that's our requirement that, okay, but we need the formatter for the element. That's the also my nice thing that uh, Scala supports. Um, at this moment, so if you like doing Java programming or uh, yeah, a lot and uh, maybe trying to compare all this uh, Java and Scala, you might look like, okay, this looks like an anonymous classes in, um, in Java. Um, it almost looks like this, but uh, Java doesn't have implicits, right? So if you would do the same idea in Java, that's how it would look like. So I tried again to map the code snippets to the same uh, structure like it was before. We have interface, then we have two static variables in instance uh, class, and we have something like an API class with the polymorphic function, where we have T as a generic parameter, and eventually, as a user, we use that in some, some method like main, and we want to print whatever FMT returns. But the downside here that we need to pass the, those type class instances manually. And then this looks like a type class in Java. Um, yeah, so if you have any question, please raise your hand or just ask. Uh, don't wait until the end. So when to use type classes? Um, I tried to um, aggregate some, some use cases, so basically the cases that I was exposed and what I see in the community and in the Scala community. So basically when you want to add a new behavior without a modification of the existing class, that's, uh, I would say, uh, or subtyping is not really possible, that would be the default approach as for me to basically um, enable in future you or your colleague to extend or add more instances that are not envisioned in, in advance. And how it is done, basically, again, we, uh, we, we looked at the example that we have something like a polymorphic function, um, this FMT, and what it's only need, this instance of, of, a, of a type class. So as long as it will be found later, we are good to go. So that's this nice property of the type classes in general. Also another thing is the runtime and compile time dispatch. So with the type classes we are targeting um, compile time dispatch, whereas with the subtyping it depends on which type right now, a particular variable, a particular call site in the runtime and then dispatch is, is going on with just a super method or the current method or, or another method. So with the Type classes, you have more static guarantees, again, more nice, and more uh, safer programs. Um, with subtyping polymorphism, let's, let's imagine that we try to tackle this 
formatting uh, problem with subtypes. So how would how we would do this in Scala? We could do again with the traits, the some for interface, and then we have a uh, case classes for that, which I believe in Haskell so like something like a data classes. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, so the for wonderful float and boolean we could define using case classes, implementing the def uh, FMT method and doing some, some implementation for these particular, particular types. And eventually we um, put them into the into the list and and then when we need to print um, we need to format the whole list, we, we go for every individual element we call this FMT function on it. On a value of, of a list, which is basically a uh, formatted type, and subtype would be the float val or boolean val. So with ad hoc polymorphism type classes, we, we do this a bit differently. So we define somewhere the instances, then we import them, and we're using this polymorphic function, and we say explicitly, or this also could can be inferred by a uh, Scala compiler, so there's a local type inference in Scala. You don't necessarily need to put um, this type here in the list of float below, but uh, this is how, how this would look like. Um, so you have instances on one side and you have our uh, type class on one side. So everything is detached, so not couple, so it's, it's nicer. But you might notice that in this example, Scala example with the type classes, we had a, a homogeneous list, right? So only uh, of formatter type, and for example, if we want to do a heterogeneously, so we can also do this in Scala. It looks a bit uh, maybe tedious. That's one of the example I found with the something like a wrapper where we have a trait and object. Basically, then we use it to create an instances of, of this class. So it's called W. Something stands for wrapper, and I add, we add a couple of more type tags here. And you see this type A equals to A zero. And what it says here that, okay, I will work, I will apply, I will create new W, new wrapper, as long as there is a formatter for this particular uh, A0, which will be assigned to A. So how does it look like from user perspective? Um, how, how the instance for this type class would, be, would look like is something like that. So formatter of, of W for formatter. And, and the implementation of this would be like, w.fa, so we take the formatter first, we call it this FMT function, and then we take the, that value that we want to format, which was inside w, with inside the rubber. And eventually this will allow us to do something like this. Um, so we have a list that still kind of uh, becomes um, homogeneous, like the same, the same w type inside the list. Um, but it allows us to, to compose, or put their different nested types. And the same property, so if we put a wrapper for, for two, for, for integer, that it won't compile because that uh, live uh, method in object W uh, has the uh, constraints that it needs the formatter around for, for any A. And this, if this A is two, and this is any integer, but we didn't uh, create an instance for, for integer, so this is why it will not compile and has a set of guarantees and compile time here in Scala. Um, another approach would be with uh, tackling this with the pattern matching. So, for example, we have our, a trait uh, which we use for a type class itself. And here we just use like, like a normal trait, I would say, in Scala. Um, and we pattern match, trying to understand what's actually current the type of, of an object using pattern match, where we say, okay, if it's a float, do this. If it's a boolean, do something different. And the problem here, every new type requires modification of this particular uh, place, right? So this will again leads to to the bad bad style that you need to go back to your original program. Or basically, you, you might not even able to modify that original code. That's the problem with this approach. So type classes, as design choice, um, used perhaps in many many libraries, and uh, I would say it's quite good default approach to do polymorphism in your libraries. If you do some kind of libraries for your, your company, for your project, at work, you have internal libraries, so that you, you may use those uh, inside uh, type classes 
I mean, you might adopt some kind of libraries uh, with poor, like the DSL, I don't know how you call them, but this could be a um, good idea to use them in your general libraries. There are, of course, uh, many examples in the community libraries in Scala, where um, uh, some library um, which are helping with the functional programming, for example, CATS, which enables or adds a lot of type classes uh, for functional design patterns. And one of the popular examples of the type classes is our uh, converters, and colors, and decoders for JSON. And there are many libraries in, in Scala doing that. And they are calling these type classes to basically serialize, to serialize. Was, was it's all names like reads, writes, reader, writer, color, decoder. And there are also examples of, of the same technique of type classes in the standard Scala library itself. Um, I have some kind of short side note about Rust uh, and kind of similarities, but I will, I will skip this for now and we'll see if we have time. I will get back to Rust slides. So I wanted to do some short segue from Rust to Scala. But, anyways, um, so type class generation, there are some. Um, plugin that helps to not write in all this boilerplate for that we saw as the ingredients in Scala, uh, which, is, which is called Simulacrum, and with the specific type annotation, you only need to define your the type uh, class definition, put this annotation, and then there are some macros which are generating uh, additional code in compile time. But then as a user, you only can, you only need just, uh, well, you can use them once you have an instance, of course, this plugin cannot generate your instances because it doesn't know the business logic you need these instances. But for um, for information, what this plugin will generate is a bunch of classes. So if you look at the file system and, and your target folder, there are like a bunch of classes for uh, extension method, for lookups, uh, additional utility things. So from just from one trade, that will be will generate a lot of byte code, right, this dot class, uh, class file extension. So, for example, this, this kind of stuff will be generated, you, you won't be needed to, to write that, like uh, uh, extension methods using this formatter oops uh, idea. This will be already <coughs> generated by that plugin and some of the lookup or polymorphic function that, that we also wrote by ourselves before. So this kind of plugin will help. So if we look at, um, summarize what are kind of drawbacks with the type process in Scala, <coughs> there is no um, language support at the moment, at this in the current um, version of Scala, which is 2.13. And we use, well, we based um, on a trade, it was an object keyword to implement to encode the type classes and instances, as we saw. And there is also some problem with ambiguous instances where there is no global coherence. We may end up having the same type instance for the same type, and then we'll need to resolve it manually. Also, like a, one example, look at our example where we have uh, hybrid type classes for uh, traverse and monad, which are both share, so they can form a hierarchy in Scala as well, and then they both share the functor a type class, and eventually if we Right, functional like, like this, my fun. Then when I look up the functor, it may find both um, and traverse uh, one. So it compiler doesn't know which map do you mean um, from from the um, traverse one up because both extend the functor and you just said okay, I just want to implicitly found functor. But it could, could be an error. And in order to avoid this, you would need to disambiguate this kind of function, so there is no uh, proper support for that, but there are some techniques to, to do to, to avoid such errors. Also, another uh, drawback would be multi-parameter type, class, type classes, where you might want some type dependency between the uh, type class parameters. And simple example with addition, you might you, you can still define something like instances for addition and result type where result type kind of will be a bit surprised if you um, if you if you will expect that two ints will always result into ints. But somebody wrote an instance that will has int into double, so there is an uh, instance that results to a double result of addition to ints. 
and then you may end up to having this uh, result with the 3.0, so just three. So you might want to have some dependence, uh, dependent types in, in this uh, type class instances definition. Um, and yeah, now there is a, you know, let's look at the how type classes are basically designed in uh, Scala 3. And I think now they have became stable, um, what I looked uh, last time in the, in the new Scala version. And also there was a nice talk on the type level and uh, summit uh, from Martin Wojcicki, uh, who is the author of Scala compiler. That they, they finally finalized the, the concept of the, uh, of the type classes, so basically the, the, the whole implicit concept in Scala 2. In Scala 3, it's, it becomes much, much better. And how does it look like? Um, same problem with formatting. Um, we have a type class definition with still with a trait, which is okay. So we are uh, struggling to define a trait with, with those functions that we want to create the instances for later. And then instances we use with new constructs called delegate. Then there is a new, um, well, there is a keyword for our defining instance for. And then we say literally, uh, so we create a delegate for format, for formatter of float, and then we define a function, which which is a FMT. Also, you, you may find here or see that there is also embedded or a support of extension methods. Or so you can you, you don't need to write additional code to enable those postfix notation, right? So you don't you don't, you don't really need um, if you want to call this uh, as dot FMT, you already have it here. Uh, so define this first the def, then there is a parenthesis and then fmt. That means that you will call this method as a postfix notation. Same idea for um, for more complex of conditional uh, type class instance for, for a list, which says, okay, we are defining formatter for a list of t, as long as there is a given formatter of for t, then we can, we, can leave, we can work with that. Then a bit later in the definition, we look up this formatter for t, we delegate, well, like we did before, for every element of the list, we uh, call on our formatter for t, the spt function, passing the e to, to get the string out of it. At least there, it's uh, something like new fancy keyword method for, instead of implicitly, but it's promising that it's like more, more type, um, uh, exact type um, than, than implicitly. Yeah, how does it work by end of the day with just this code snippet that you have a list and we have instance for boolean and for a list and we have automatically this postfix way dot from t to, to format the whole list. <coughs> so this is much, much better than the new Scala compiler. And yeah, this kind of stuff, um, you can still write if you wanted this kind of polymorphic function in same in the way like, like we did before, formatted lot of MT and then you pass the list. You can do you can also implement that. But here instead of implicitly basically implicit implicit keyword, uh, shortly it was divided into multiple keywords and multiple concepts in this new uh, Scala compiler. And here instead of just implicit parameter formatter what we can apply method we, we we use given so it's kind of more natural um, perspective and basically I'm almost finished and just for reference um, that there is other languages which also has something like a concept of type classes as well and yeah rust as well and I'm not sure if we have time to, to show that I think it's only five minutes and there are some links in, in my slides if you want to check later um, which I use basically to prepare the talk and the inspiration it was like a good video from Evan Kmet about how the type classes and the world. Uh, basically, it's mainly about the Haskell type classes. And the good video, which is quite recent from Martin on type level, sign up the link below. And um, yeah, basically, that's it. Thank you for your audience.